Good morning, everyone. Hopefully you can hear me okay. And I want to welcome you this morning to our webinar. Um, I am so excited to be able to host this this morning and also have two guest presenters with me, Maria Dektiar and Emily Braun from Boston University. And they are uh, the lead authors of the group and team that put together the recent uh, AJSLP study on the video conference equivalence between the WABR and in-person testing. So welcome, Emily and Maria. I want to introduce them a little bit more as well and tell you a little bit about their background. Um, and then we're going to jump in. So Maria graduated uh, with her BA in Neuroscience and Psychology from Boston University and worked as a research assistant at Brigham and Women's prior to becoming a lab manager for Dr. Swathi Kiran in her lab at Boston University. She's currently a second year doctoral student in the clinical psych program at UT Austin, working in the clinical neuroscience lab under the supervision of Dr. Andriana, Andriana Haley. I hope I said that right, Maria. And so welcome, Maria. Thank you. Yep, got it right. <laughs> Thank you. And then the second co-presenter that I have today is Emily Braun, who graduated from Northwestern in the SLP program in 2012. She completed her CF at Mary and Joy Rehab Hospital in Wheaton, Illinois, and worked there for three years, and then worked in the Center for Aphasia Research and Treatment at Shirley Ryan Ability Lab for three years. So this uh, AJSLP study that she and Maria led is a project she did toward completion of her doctoral program. So welcome, Emily. Thank you so much, Tina. So let's jump in and get started. First, of course, um, disclosures. I need to disclose that I am uh, on staff here at Pearson Clinical Assessment, um, certified member of ASHA. I'm also a member of SIG 1, 16, and 18. My SIG 2 days are in my past as I worked clinically in neuroscience and trauma at the Mayo affiliate in Western Wisconsin. Um, I am on two Facebook groups from a non-financial standpoint, telepractice for SLPs and SLP telepractice collaboration. And um, my final disclosure is I am a past president of the Wisconsin State Association. So with that, let's jump into our agenda this morning. We just, I wanted to set up a few learning objectives for us, um, some initial context for this conversation today, and then give Maria and Emily some time to talk about the Boston University study that they did and the resulting article in AJSLP in case some of you haven't seen it or been able to read it yet. And then we're going to jump in very quickly to the actual telepractice guidance documentation that we've put together, certainly um, also with deep uh, engagement with the Boston University study as well, and then certainly have time to answer questions at the end. So with that agenda in mind, learning objectives. Uh, three that I came up with for our time today. One really important to be able to think about five factors to consider when completing assessment via telepractice. In this case, today we'll be talking specifically about the WAB-R. The second learning outcome really is to have all of you be able to describe the difference between norms for telepractice and task equivalence when we're talking about in-person versus remote. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about how we should think about um, evidence related to in-person versus remote assessment. And then finally, um, really list, have you be able to list at least three considerations, we'll talk about many, um, to evaluate an examinee's readiness and appropriateness for a remote test administration of the WABAR. These are some pretty basic learning objectives, but hopefully uh, you'll be, all be able to complete those and much more by the end of this hour. But first, and I know this is a small slide, you'll get it in your hand up, but let me, of course, set this appropriate context. Um, here on this one-hour webinar, we're in no way um, giving you all the answers related to telepractice. So certainly we're focused on the Western aphasia battery revised today, um, but certainly all of the ethical and legal and practical organizational requirements that we are all under individually and collectively apply and must be considered in the context of any choices that we would make clinically in remote assessment. So we very much encourage you certainly um, in this Pearson-sponsored webinar to follow all of those guidelines, certainly from ASHA, other professional associations, 
legal and um, organizational requirements that you have really in addition to developing your own individual competence and capabilities with assessment via telepractice. So this is just the beginning, this is not the end of the conversation, but certainly as we go forth as professionals, our clinical judgment in these situations is paramount, and rightly so, as we're working at the top of our licenses and moving between these modes of in-person versus remote. Finally then, this context of course is the documentation requirements that we have as professionals for anything that we do, um, especially now in this context of remote assessment. So just wanted to make sure that that is the ground, grounding and the foundational set of thoughts as we begin this conversation and how important those are for us individually and professionally. So with that in mind, I'm very excited to have Maria and Emily um, spend a few minutes. If you haven't had a chance to read the, the AJSLP article, I've just taken a snip um, with the DOI there that you'll get in your handout if you haven't read it yet. It is open access right now, thanks to ASHA for some time, so if you haven't logged in and grabbed that off the Astro Wire, um, I encourage you very much to do so. So with that, let me turn it over to Maria and Emily to give us a brief overview of the study. Thank you so much, Tina. Um, so we, this is Emily speaking, uh, and we'll talk briefly about the study. Uh, and then if you have additional questions after that, uh, Maria and I are happy to answer those in the chat uh, or in questions at the end, uh, or of course, you know, with follow-up emails. Um, so in our lab, uh, Maria and uh, Claudia Penelosa, who is a postdoctoral associate in the lab, uh, worked on developing this protocol for video conference administration of the WAB. Um, and we really had a need to be able to complete teleassessment with our research participants, uh, some of whom um, weren't able to come into the lab, and we wanted to be able to reach this population. But obviously, um, th there's broader importance, too, with clinical practice. Uh, so in the study, uh, we wanted to look at this protocol and uh, determine whether it was feasible and uh, if we saw equivalence between uh, scores from in-person versus video conference assessment. We had 20 individuals with chronic post-stroke aphasia participate and they all completed the WAB twice, once in person and once via video conference uh, between one and two weeks apart. Uh, and in most cases, there were two separate examiners um, who completed the testing. And the tests were also counterbalanced, so half the participants completed the video conference first and half completed the in-person first. We um, had to make several modifications to the test to make it compatible with video conference. Um, and uh, two of the main, I, I think, most important things are first, um, we presented the test stimuli in a digital format and used a video conference platform where we were able to share our screen so the participant could view the test items. Um, and then the other piece is we needed a way for uh, us to see participants pointing responses for several of the subtests. So in our case, uh, we used, uh, because we used Zoom, we were able to use the share controls feature and see the participants moving their mouse. Um, but there's other ways to do this um, if this method is not available or not feasible, um, and Tina um, can go into that a little bit later. Um, most of our participants completed uh, the video conference assessment at home. We wanted the study to be as ecologically valid as possible. Um, so for our results, we found with intraclass correlations excellent reliability between the video conference and the in-person assessment. Uh, so the scores were very similar um, for those uh, overall measures, the AQ, LQ, and CQ on the WAB between in-person and video conference. We also looked at some additional um, statistical analysis um, looking at first versus second administration to make sure the participants weren't just getting better the second time they took the test, and we didn't find that to be the case either. In addition to that, we were interested in knowing whether the participants were comfortable with the video conference assessment. And most participants reported they were happy with video conference assessment, they were equally satisfied with both, and they'd be willing to participate in the teleassessment again. For our three participants who reported they 
were not, that they prefer in-person assessment. Um, two of them had reported being not comfortable with technology prior to the study. So I think that's an important consideration when we're thinking about who is a good candidate for teleassessment. And then uh, the last thing I'll mention here uh, is in the few instances when we found discrepancies between um, AQ scores, um, AQ, LQ, or CQ scores between the two different types of tests, we dug into that a little bit to see if we could find any patterns. Um, and we did not find patterns related to the in-person versus video conference assessment. So it wasn't the case that participants were always performing better on a particular subtest in one or the other um, type of assessment. Um, the kinds of things that we saw seemed to be more due to individual variability and uh, a broader test retest uh, reliability uh, question. Um, so those are the uh, overall results of this study. Uh, Maria, is there anything else um, that we should add here? Thanks, Emily. I think the only other thing that I would add is that um, for many of our participants, we did rely pretty heavily on their caregivers to give some kind of assistance to them, whether it was in setup of the online testing um, or during the testing itself. And we also provided in our paper some guidance about how to set up the caregiver um, to help out with this kind of testing. But otherwise, I think Emily covered the study really well. Thank you. Great, thanks for adding that. That's a, a really important point. Wonderful, thanks to both of you. Um, and, I, and I'm just so appreciative of not only having you here to describe that in your thinking today, but also um, Maria gave a really perfect segue into the beginning of our deep discussion here in the details of remote test administration. So. Um, COVID-19 notwithstanding, certainly our, our work at Pearson to date um, in the speech and language space dates back to about 2012, um, where we did our first study in combination, er, in collaboration, excuse me, with uh, colleagues at Presence Learning and at Connections Education uh, to start looking at, at remote test delivery. So back in 2012-2013, we looked at some four different tests, the PPVT, the EVT, the GFTA, and the SELF um, with those two uh, collaboration groups. And in about 300 cases, we also found and started our learning journey on remote assessment. And one of the things that um, both Emily and Maria highlighted is the number of, sort of details or nuances that come up as we think about remote test delivery. And Maria's last comment is, a great segue here into this next slide, which talks about the use of facilitators. When we're thinking about remote assessment, um, we at Pearson will always recommend having a facilitator on hand. There may be cases where you don't need one, um, but for most of the assessments that you would do, especially those that are standardized, that require different kinds of responses, we would recommend the use of a facilitator. You may call them e-helpers or proctors or some other term to define that other non-examinee on the examinee's side. And we've put this, this one page piece together that I'm showing you the top half of um, that's on our website. If you're thinking about facilitators, um, that may be helpful to you in this context. I know that the um, Boston University team in their study commented about those facilitators as well. That's very relevant information and certainly this um, hopefully will be an asset to you as you consider facilitators in remote assessment. In particular, I have one um, focus area of this slide as we go in then into the guidance document. Um, and that is uh, thinking about remote assessment via task type. So often, and I think the, the main uh, conversation is around, is test X ready for telepractice? Is, is um, the sum total of those those tasks on that test ready to go. Uh, the way we think about it is it really depends on the task itself. So what we've done in this document, and certainly you'll see that come through in the guidance document as we go through it today, is that really, really put tasks, or remote assessment tasks into four buckets. The first one being those questionnaire type tasks, which are pretty straightforward. Um, they're 
forms that you can send out to the examinee or to a caregiver or a parent and have them complete and come back. They're often asynchronous. They can be done in a synchronous way, but those are sort of one kind of task type. Some of them are standardized. Some of them are more informal or criterion referenced, not normed. But questionnaires are sort of in a class by themselves when it comes to remote assessment. The second kind of tasks are those tasks that are verbal only, so one modality. You're not sharing any pictures. You're not doing anything with manipulatives. You're simply using face-to-face, uh, -face, remotely, of course, um, and using a verbal medium to deliver stimulus content and then get response content back from the examinee. The third bucket of tasks really are two modality, a verbal and a visual. So things like a picture description task on the WABAR where you as the clinician maybe have a spoken direction um, with a picture stimuli and then the response from the examinee is verbal only or a pointing response. Um, so those verbal and visual tasks are more complex than verbal only tasks, but certainly not as complex as the fourth bucket, which we call, um, in a straightforward way, of course, complex tasks. Those are tasks that require manipulatives. Those are tasks that require writing responses where you need to see what the examinee is writing. When you add a third modality in some way, those tasks are by definition complex. And so they need different kinds of practice, different kinds of training, um, different setups on the examinee side. And so we think about those differently. So when we think about equivalence uh, in terms of tasks, we think about it at that level rather than at the full test level because it gives us a little bit more detail and nuance on how we think about and test for equivalence. So with that backdrop, I want to move into the main part here of our session today, which talks about this guidance document that, um, thanks to the Boston team and their research, and certainly other research that has been done over the years, both within the SLP domain as well as external to our domain from uh, uh, sister disciplines, if you will, um, to bring us to this guidance document today. If you'd like to follow along, it is on our website. If you go to pearsonassessments.com, in the top right search box, search on WABR. Um, it will pull up the page and you can certainly see and follow along as we go through the document here in slides uh, out on the web. So in our guidance documents, we tend to have uh, a structure now that we're using. Our early documents from 2012 and 2013 are on our website as well for the PPVT, for example, um, or the EVT. But now in our you know, last few months, we've generated sort of a new framework for how we're going to do these guidance documents. Um, which incorporate research like what Maria and Emily described. So you're going to see an introduction. You're going to see a, a representative of the five factors, and those five factors come out of that early 2012-2013 work that we did that I described a minute ago. We did an 18-hour video review of actual assessments by a telepractice and came up with these five factors or five themes in our ASHA presentation in 2013 um, that we're using as a framework for developing these guidance documents. First, the telepractice is environment and equipment, um, assessment procedures and materials, which we'll spend a fair amount of time on today, uh, and then examinee and examiner considerations and those other considerations, sort of a miscellaneous grouping at the end. So these five factors are really uh, the frame, as I mentioned, under which our guidance documents are developed. Within the assessment procedures and materials, um, Table 1 and Table 2 is what we're calling the, the detailed places where we describe inputs and outputs, or these task demands by assessment task. Table 2 is really then the aggregation of the evidence base by task, so that you can really see where that equivalent science comes from. And then finally, in the framework, we come to a conclusion that hopefully helps guide uh, professionals such as yourselves, and then a reference list, of course. So this is a link uh, in blue here at the bottom of the slide. If you um, haven't gotten to the web page yet or won't follow along when you get the handout after the fact, here today, you'll be able to link straight from this slide over to the document. In the introduction for the, the WABAR uh, telepractice guidance, we always want to anchor to external sources as well because, of course, ASHA's practice portal is a main source for us as SLPs 
for moving ahead with telepractice. It's a great place. If you haven't been there, I have to give a shout out to the ASHA team, of course, and all of you who contributed to the practice portal. Um, and then we also put in an anchor for uh, our Q Global system, which is really where the digital versions now of the WABAR and other tests of ours are located. Um, we can talk more about the logistics of that at the end, but we do that in our guidance documents so that people know how we think about delivering that digital content um, and protecting it from a test security standpoint. And then finally in the introduction, we do talk about facilitators and reference the doc that I shared with you a couple of slides ago. And that really uh, comprises the, the bulk of the introduction uh, and certainly is a good foundation then to go into the five factors. This is a SNP from the guidance document on our website which lists those five factors. Again, these five factors came from the earliest study that we did. It was really a pilot, um, about 300 cases um, for our work in 2012 and 2013 which led to an ASHA presentation um, that was accepted that we did then in 2013 in November. Uh, and these five themes are what we use then to go forward. So let's jump in. Um, telepractice environment and equipment. Certainly in this remote context, that is a big section of considerations. Emily and Maria talked you know, uh, a bit about what they had to consider in their study. We've tried to be as exhaustive as we can for all the things that you should consider as you think about conducting a remote assessment. Um, depending on the test, of course, this list, this in this case, has 14 items on it. Um, depending on the test, there may be more or less, um, depending on the scope and the kinds of tasks. Um, in this area, you can see as you go into the document, if you're there or after the fact, that we've tried to account for anything that relates to setting up the examiner or the examinee to do the, uh, to deliver content uh, remotely across any of the tasks. So from what kind of computers, reminding that screen size changes the size of the stimuli and not all of that has been studied. So trying to get a consistent presentation of image size is important to consider. Um, certainly the telepractice platform that you're using makes a difference in terms of the functionality. I know that the Boston study used a couple of different ones, but I think in the article they, you guys said you preferred Zoom. Uh, it is a great platform. We don't recommend a platform at Pearson, but it's certainly a consideration uh, for anybody doing remote assessment. Um, in the video quality, uh, we also have recommendations and guidance on how to think about video quality and thinking about how to set that up on both examiner and examinee side. Uh, screen sharing is, is a piece we've talked about that's really a requirement. And really thinking about both audio and video. Um, the audio capabilities, as we all understand as SLPs, is paramount to many of our test items and our test task types. And so we want to think about that audio setup as well as what I'm seeing of the examinee's face when I'm giving an item. So certainly those kinds of details and guidance and recommendations. One, one bullet in particular that I want to highlight is this notion of a peripheral camera or device. Um, and that is for those tasks and the four task types that I mentioned earlier and sort of walked through is the verbal and visual task as well as those complex tasks. We really have seen the value, and others have as well, if you look out in the, the listservs as well as the, the Facebook groups or any sort of other professional conversations that go on, the ability to add an extra camera on the examinee's side allows you to, in various hack or fully functional kinds of ways, to deliver the ability for you as the clinician to view the pointing response of the examinee, or to alt if a mouse isn't possible, or to view the writing work of that examinee during an administration. And um, just by way of background, um, we actually went to school on this in-house right after COVID sort of started and we completed a number of evaluations across all our qualified users um, internally to really test out this peripheral camera use and how that works. We do have a third camera hack video on our website. If you 
want to go look at some ways that we tested this out and tried this because everybody was at home um, and thinking about that. So that peripheral camera or, or device can be invaluable, whether or not you have a facilitator, but certainly to allow you as the clinician to control that environment in testing. And I would really recommend people think about that for some of the tasks on the WAB. And so we want to keep, keep thinking about that and working on that. Um, as we get better at doing remote assessment as a profession and as individual clinicians. Having that allows you to capture written performance in a new way and really in a, in a way that allows you to manage that as the examiner, even remotely. Um, and really, our recommendation then beyond that third camera is to go through and check those other task types to make sure that you manage not only any audiovisual on the examinee side that might be distracting, all of the lighting considerations that you need so the light is on the examinee's face, not behind them, so you don't get funny shadows, especially for phonemic-based tasks. And then looking at the room of the examinee, whether they're at home or whether they're in a clinic in a you know, separate room or in a different facility across the state, for example, if you're working um, in a different location, all of those things on the examining side that might disrupt this standardized performance. Um, so th those are some thoughts. Emily or Maria, do you have any um, experience from the study in particular that you might add into this environment and equipment topic? Yeah, I was just thinking um, one small thing that we realized when we were going through the studies, a lot of our participants preferred using a mouse rather than the trackpad on the laptop. Um, it made it easier for them to point and click. Um, and so I guess one thing to consider is to just ask if they have a mouse or maybe provide a mouse for people who prefer to do that. Right, exactly. Thanks, Maria. And I think I would add, too, to that. You know, obviously, this is one of the considerations if the patient has any hemiparesis or anything left over from a stroke, for example, mouse might be available and might not be available as a consideration so if it can work and you can watch that mouse movement through your telepractice platform for a pointing response that's great if you can't and you need to watch that gestural response to the screen that additional camera on the examinee side that you would set up um, is a way to manage that and work around that um, mouse inability at the time so um, great, great suggestion. Let's move on to the assessment procedures and materials. Um, and, and so in this case, there are a number of pieces for the, the WABAR in particular that we have to take into account. Because the tasks have verbal and visual, it's sort of those last two uh, task types to the right of verbal visual task, as well as complex tasks, we have to think about what we're going to do about the blocks and manipulatives. We have to think about what digital assets we need to deliver the stimuli. And then this is where we come to our input and output requirements in Table 1 and in Table 2 in the guidance document. So let's, let's go into these in, in detail a little bit. So there is, as we all know, a block design task on the Western Aphasia Battery Revised. It's a four-block task as opposed to some other block design tasks on other tests. Um, I think the WACE has a nine block task. There's other four block tasks in other contexts. But for this, this WABR block design task is not the same as some of those other tasks. The, the way that you administer the, the task for block design um, is, is less rigorous than some of the intelligence tests that are done. So it's able, you're able to use a trained facilitator for that if you um, teach them ahead of time how to put those blocks in front of the examinee. Um, you certainly may want to consider sending that if the examinee is at a remote location, you have to get the blocks to the facilitator to help you with that administration for sure, um, if that's possible. So we don't recommend that the examinee scramble or present their own blocks, which is really what the facilitator is there for. Some examinees, if in your clinical judgment, that's possible in this case because the, the task doesn't require the blocks to be set in a certain way, that's, that's possible. But we really do recommend that the facilitator scramble and present the blocks for each of those four items on the WAB. 
Um, in addition, there are manipulatives, of course, on the WAB. The Boston study um, took an innovation in terms of creating an image or a picture of the blocks, uh, or, I'm sorry, of the manipulatives for some of the items, and we've incorporated that into what we're calling a remote adapted stimulus book on our Q Global site. And so some of that manipulative load is reduced in, uh, with thanks to the Boston team for, for coming up with that uh, modification to the testing procedure. So as you're thinking about manipulatives, you still need some, though, for many of the tasks. So if you're looking at um, those that you need as a clinician, you also need manipulatives on the WAB side, on the examinee side for the WABR. So think about, and this is why we always recommend going through every test item before you give a remote assessment so that you know what's coming and you can prepare for those. Our guidance doc shows the list of um, manipulatives still needed despite the remote adapted stimulus book and how you might handle those having a set with you as the examiner having a set with the clinician, I'm, I'm sorry, with the examinee through the facilitator, um, there are ways to handle that. But it's reduced because of what we've added to the remote adapted stimulus book that the Boston team came up with. So certainly a consideration, lots of prep work needed on your side in terms of practice, um, and certainly thinking about cleaning those items. We've just released a new cleaning manipulatives and materials document with some guidance on how you might think about cleaning and sanitizing those manipulatives in this COVID-19 time that we have, but certainly in general, we want to keep the manipulatives that we use between examinees clean. So those are some guidance, um, detailed suggestions in our guidance document for how to handle that. Um, and then certainly from a digital asset standpoint, um, as I just mentioned, we've published a remote adapted stimulus book, which is um, at no charge right now through July 31st, as well as the original stimulus book on our Q Global site, um, as well as the manual. So if you'd like to practice or try out or uh, review these WABAR digital materials, those are um, at free access to you through the end of July. So we'd encourage you to do that and, and practice on your own or with a colleague to see how to manage those digital assets in the pre presentation in a remote context. Let's get to table one um, and talk a little bit about these input and output requirements because this is really um, intended to be very detailed at the task level. So this is just, I just snipped all this out for the ease of this presentation, but this table exists again in the guidance document on our website. And what we've done in table one is really look at um, specific considerations by subtest of the Western aphasia battery. And we've grouped them, those that have similar considerations. So for example, in the first row here, you see conversational questions, yes, no, repetition, word fluency, sentence completion, responsive speech, spelled word recognition, and spelling. Those subtests have similar considerations. And so as if you look to the second column in this table, obviously for these kinds of tasks, these are these are verbal response tasks. We need very high quality audio for both the examinee and examiner. You need to test that ahead of time, listen for those pops and clicks, make sure that the audio isn't delayed so that the examinee misses your presentation of the item. Um, you want to make sure that that audio is stable. So of course that's bandwidth um, and that's an internet issue. Uh, and so you want to consider that in your ability to deliver these tasks remotely with good equivalence and with good fidelity. So in particular, you'll see in this table, in our guidance documents, um, suggestions, mostly that came out of the Boston study, um, and, and Maria and Emily and their team in that work uh, related to modifications to items that are acceptable for a remote assessment context. So you see here in yes, no questions, you want to make sure that you orient to the clinician's location. Are the lights on in my room instead of just in the room? Um, so the examinee can really answer that question accurately and you give a good referent given your physical distance from one another. So those are appropriate considerations for those specific items in that subtest. Um, and then of course, um, as you go through this, the picture description, object naming, reading irregular words, and reading non-words also require high quality audio and video because of the verbal response of the examinee. Um, but then some extra guidance on 
um, how to demonstrate or how to talk about picture description and the reading task. So as you share screen and point with your mouse to the stimuli where you want the examinee to orient, um, a suggestion that you might want to convert to a larger cursor size, which cursor size, which most um, computers can do. Uh, you know, on your Windows, there's a setting on Windows that allows you to convert to that larger cursor size if older adults need um, something a little bit bigger. It's just a convenience or a modification that's acceptable as you orient them to part of the screen that you're sharing. In object naming, you have to make sure when you show objects in front of your camera that you get them fully into the space so that they can see the whole object and not just part of it. So um, then there's also a guide, uh, a part of the administration directions for object naming is if that didn't work and they need that tactile input, you can score on that tactile input. We just recommend having a set of objects in an opaque bag with the facilitator and then train that facilitator to bring that item out for that tactile um, opportunity as you go through the task. I think that you guys on the Boston side, Marie and Emily, removed that piece. We would recommend maybe doing it this way as well, but certainly your evidence suggests that it can be done that way. We just didn't want to limit the scoring capabilities for object naming. Slide, uh, this next slide then talks about all of these tasks on the left column that have similar considerations. I do want to point out auditory word recognition for this task. Um, Certainly there's capabilities, um, Marie and Emily and the Boston team did make some alternative choices in their item replacements for modifications, which are acceptable. And so I wanted to ask you guys, Marie or Emily, if you wanted to comment on those item adaptations that you made and any background that you want to provide the group about that. Um, sure, this, this is Emily. Yeah, I can comment briefly on that. So we. Um, we really, obviously we wanted to change the test as little as possible, but we really found um, with this population, it was really difficult uh, to administer some of those items as they were originally written over video conference um, with uh, um, not being able to see the participants um, and participants uh, not being able to adjust the camera to show um, to show us what they wanted to do. But um, I will, you know, we also didn't use that second camera. Uh, so I think that's something else to keep in mind that um, if you had that second camera, that might change how you might um, need to modify the items. Yeah, great. Thanks, Emily. So lots of considerations here, but certainly um, the Boston study and what they did provides evidence for replacing left knee, for example, with left eyebrow if needed. So you can think about that um, and certainly take that into consideration as you're practicing before you might actually give a WABAR remotely. Sequential commands, of course, there's one item modification um, that the Boston team studied and that we would accept as a recommendation, certainly. Um, and so, again, this, this particular task, because there's a pointing response, if the mouse can't be used, you can use an extra camera. It can be a cell phone, it can be a tablet, it can be anything um, that can be either brought into, or really brought into that um, uh, telepractice platform as an additional participant, if you will, and then you can position that camera Again, if you watch our third hack video, any number of ways to make the visualization of that examinee really work quite well. Um, if you don't have that third camera, you could use this item modification for uh, completing that particular item. Reading commands, um, certainly um, this is where you'd need a pencil um, in front of the examinee. You can, again, show use a peripheral camera to show pointing responses. Um, and in the remote adapted stimulus book, because this is printed, a printed item, we did in fact change the draw across with your foot item to a draw across with your finger item as the Boston University team did in the study. Um, and so in the original stim book, you'll find the original item. In the remote adapted stim book, you'll find this uh, draw across with your finger item for reading commands, just to make that a little easier in presentation. Uh, the writing upon request, irregular words uh, to dictation, and non-words to dictation. 
just really looking at that writing response. And in this case, the peripheral camera is really helpful um, so that you don't have to ask the facilitator to do more or you, you don't have to omit these items or these set tasks from your administration by changing that third camera into more of a document camera. So often we have document cameras for those of us that do telepractice a lot on our desktops on our side, but it certainly doesn't help to see writing responses of the examinee on the examinee side. So this is a great way to use um, a cell phone or a tablet or something where you can point it down over the examinee's desktop and watch that writing response. In our practice internally, it really works quite well. Uh, what, what you need to do, of course, is not only have access to an extra device on your examinee side, or in a remote facility location where you can maybe have a doc cam set up, but also you can think about that in terms of um, how to set that in a stable position. So again, I'd refer you to that third camera hacks video on our website. Moving on through writing output, copying a sentence and drawing, those are similar considerations for uh, remote assessment. And so I'd encourage you to really look at um, timing, time limit issues, certainly for writing output, um, but also uh, on the drawing task. You know, you don't have to show the stimuli unless there's been a delay in response or the examinee needs you to show that stimuli if needed. Um, and so that's a nuance in administration that I know the Boston team dealt with in their study as well. I encourage you to look at that, but also consider not sharing the screen if you don't need to, but then being prepared to share that if in the administration directions, of course, you can show the stimuli to the examinee to complete that drawing task. So it's a nuance that you'll need to practice in your administration, which is not the same as if you're in person. Then writing to dictation, writing dictated words, alphabet and numbers, dictated letters and numbers, those tasks are similar in terms of um, showing objects in front of the clinician camera for writing dictated words again if needed. Um, and really considering, again, those writing outputs and how you'll capture that examinee performance real time. Um, apraxia is another one where we have to really look at um, what the role of the facilitator is and make sure they can present that paper and a phone on the table directly in front of the examinee for those items. But certainly to move through this task, that peripheral camera and device can be really helpful to see what the examinee is doing without any modifications um, more than are needed. And then block, ooh, where am I? Block design, we talked about a little bit already um, and how we would ask the facilitator to train, to be trained to then participate in that block design facilitation. And again, we separate in this facilitator's document that I mentioned earlier, the difference between a trained or a professional level facilitator, like an SLPA or um, another trained professional colleague, as opposed to a parent or caregiver. We separate those considerations for kinds of facilitators that are used, um, and we would recommend that you think about them a little differently, especially when they're involved in tasks like block design. So um, consider this, and um, this, this task is one of those complex tasks, of course, that requires a fair amount of practice um, before you would actually administer it. Let me pause before I go to table, uh, table two. I'm checking our time to make sure that we're moving on as we need to, which we are. Um, Maria and Emily, any final comments from you about considerations at the task level? Okay. Um, let's go then to table two, and this, this is really um, something that our scientific council and, and one of our lead research directors came up with in terms of format, um, and I think it's really helpful because it reinforces how important it is to really look at the task type as opposed to just lumping all those tasks in one test together and looking at just the test. I mean, I know the Boston team learned this in their study as well. We certainly have learned it as we've looked at telepractice over the years. Um, considering evidence at the task level allows us to expand the way we think about evidence and really bring multiple studies to play and to bear as we're looking at the support for different task types in remote assessment. So this table two is, I'll just orient you to the table this way and then if you're following along on the web or if you look at it after the fact, you'll, you'll be able to um, 
really very easily look at how we're setting this up. So we think about tasks in terms of inputs and outputs. And there's a code at the bottom of the table in all our new guidance documents that describe those inputs and put them into categories. So it's really a, a thematic look at what our test tasks require in terms of what the clinician does or the examiner does versus the examinee. So for example, conversational questions and spelling has a similar input. There's a spoken stimuli that's going on. There's no other pictures. There's nothing else going on. It's simply verbal input in terms of spoken stimuli. That's what the SS stands for. Then we look at the outputs. Um, what is the examinee required to do to provide that response? And in this case, for conversational questions and spelling, it's a brief spoken response, or BSR, as opposed to picture description right below it, which is a spoken response, a longer. We expect more language in that response to come out. The brief spoken responses are really at the word level. Um, and anything beyond that, we would say that requires a larger linguistic output. And so we've separated those output requirements because there really are different linguistically. And as you look through the tasks of the WAB R, you're really looking at those different inputs and outputs as they go and classifying them in terms of what's required. Um, then once you look and define that task type, you can say, oh, where is the evidence for that kind of task, either specifically with the WAB or the WAB R, or with similar tasks on other tests. I, I go back to the PPVT as a quick example. Four pictures on a screen, you know, point to X, there's a pointing response or a selection of one of the four pictures. That's a pretty straightforward task. There are lots of tests out in the world that have a similar type task. So with all of the evidence for a conversational questions task or a picture task like the PPVT, we probably have already studied that many times. And in fact, these kinds of tasks we have studied many times. So each of those numbers in the final two columns in this table represent individual studies that have looked at that task and provided evidence in some way for that task. So in, in this case, Number eight is the Boston study. So you'll see this as we go through this table briefly. The Boston study, of course, did the entire WABAR. The studies 22 and 23 in the reference list at the bottom of the guidance documents are early, doc early studies that, the, um, that uh, Dr. Terry Wirtz's team did at the VA in the late 60s and early 70s on the original WABAR. They had very strong studies, of course, as you'd expect. The VA has been a leader in telepractice. Um, those studies from the early days on the original WAB had really decent sample sizes um, and certainly provided some really good evidence on that original version. What we don't have, though, is what we did in the revised version and all the tasks we've added, which is really what the Boston study was able to do, is do the whole revised version of the WAB. But those early studies still provide evidence for these tasks. And then the evidence with similar tasks have to do with tests like other aphasia tests that have similar tests. We know that there are common test types across aphasia tests. Certainly some of our intelligence tests out there, there's a line of research on the WACE and, the, and the, some of the other um, adult neuro tasks, either cognitive or what have you, that provide evidence for these tests. And I think we can aggregate that together very quickly and say, this kind of task really has been studied a lot. We have lots of evidence to suggest that these are equivalent between in-person and remote assessment. So that's the orientation to this table. I think it's a very powerful table in terms of providing evidence. You can see as we go through the WABAR tasks, some of the tasks are really quite similar in terms of input and output requirements. And certainly the studies here on this column here with the WABAR, this 8, 9, 22, 23, um, you know, column is specifically on the WABAR tasks in particular, but there's quite a bit of external evidence on these tasks from other tests. Now you'll see as we get through now, starting at comprehensive, comprehension of sentences, this is where the WABAR changed and added all of the tasks that it has in the current version. And so really the, the science around the actual WABAR task is really predicated on the Boston study, which just released here in March, which is so great. That's not to say that there's not other evidence on these tasks in other places, which is, again, this far right column. So it allows us, when we look at the task once again, to say, okay, look, yes, we have a study here on the WABAR that's great and a foundational anchor for our evidence in this space, and we have 
additional evidence from other studies that use similar tasks that we can aggregate onto this work. Copying a sentence is copying a sentence. And sometimes the tasks are slightly different, but nearly identical. But as you look at this, there's evidence for that across the science. And so then finally, as we look at this, this is the end of table two. Again, this is on our website if you're following along. You can look at this and, and make judgments about the evidence base for these different tasks, certainly around individual studies, but then at the aggregate as well. And we want to present all the science that we know exists related to that. Now, as we think about this, I did want to make a couple of comments because we're getting so many questions over the last few months related to when are you going to norm something for telepractice? How does the norming work? Um, what is Pearson's thinking about this? And so we really wanted to provide some good information on how we suggest that we as a discipline and certainly all our, all our disciplines that we support talk about requirements for norming versus evidence versus equivalency. And so really our anchor for evidence um, is really the standards, which is the, the document or the book that's, that's pulled together the standards for educational and psychological tests. We call them the standards, sort of our foundational tool for making decisions on test development. These standards are published in joint, joint publication from AERA, APA, and the NCME. Um, and so as we look at how to think about telepractice norms or telepractice equivalence evidence, really what the standards say is this is a mode change. We're not changing the construct of what we're testing. We're changing the mode. And in the standards, what's required for a mode change is, is really it's a format change. So we need a sound rationale for calling it a mode change, which we're doing in person versus telepractice, is um, certainly a change of format or mode of delivery. We have to present empirical evidence when it's possible and when it's available, which we've done. Um, and these inputs and those kinds of things is how we determine the applicability of score precision and how to use the normative data that exists for a different mode. And so when we think about reliability and validity of whether or not we can use the scores, which is the question that we get so often, we really go back to the standards and say, what's required in terms of evidence for a mode change, which is what this is in telepractice. We're going from in-person to remote. So if the change is suspected of affecting the validity of score interpretation, such as that the, the change modifies or changes the construct being assessed, then we need to look at evidence for validity. <clears throat> And certainly, excuse me, because we're changing modes, we need evidence for that validity of that mode change. But it doesn't mean that we need new norms. What we need to do is establish equivalence, which is what the Boston University study has done, which is so much of what has been done in the literature. So we go to this first section here under the yellow two-person icon. So we complete equivalent studies according to what the standards say we need to do, which is what we're, we've done in the past, what others have done like the Boston team has done externally, and we need to aggregate those equivalency studies to say um, what, what's happening here in this mode change. And then that evidence may suggest that the construct has changed because the mean differences between the modes are too large. So right now, what the Boston study showed and what other studies have showed is that difference, the mean differences between those mode presentations are not large. If they were, then we may consider that independent norms are necessary. Um, certainly, we would consider that as a test publisher if the test is developed solely for telepractice, which none of our tests are at this point, um, or substantial evidence based on these first two comments show that the construct is quite a bit different by a mean difference change between the modes. So right now, because we're not seeing that, it's really not, not something that we're going to talk about in terms of telepractice norms, because the evidence for equivalence doesn't suggest that they're needed. Instead, what we re really are required to show is equivalence uh, evidence for those that mode change. And so I hope that language is clear to people as we think about how we think about the evidence or the science behind in-person versus remote assessment. Uh, and now as we think about just the last couple of slides here I have because I'm cognizant of time, then our guidance documents go really into the examinee considerations, which are many, 
Um, in terms of appropriateness, preparedness, um, Marie and Emily talked about this a little bit earlier as well. Not all examinees are appropriate for remote administration. There is a preparedness that we need to um, support examinees with who may participate. We need to train facilitators for sure in detail prior to an administration remotely and really to consider the impact of a headset for audio input as well as their capabilities of a mouse. So these are, these are going to feel like common sense, but certainly in a guidance document we wanted to be very detailed about how you think about and how you make clinical judgments around your best, um, your best professional opinion about whether or not an examinee is ready for a telepractice uh, administration. So certainly the three legs of the EBP stool in terms of client values, um, Emily or, or Maria commented earlier about the couple of examinees in their study who weren't as comfortable with technology um, but could still participate in the study. That's a factor that you need to consider. Um, examiner considerations certainly is the next bucket of the five factors of work in terms of your requirement to practice. This is not something you shoot from the hip on, of course. This is something you need to go through every item in a telepractice context and um, take your time to make sure that you are fluent in the standardized procedures in a remote context and honor those uh, as you need to during that administration. And then, of course, back to table one and all those considerations in your prep moving forward. And then finally, other considerations, things like report writing, things like um, orienting to why you're doing this evaluation to begin with, um, and really did the examinee give you their best performance. All of those things go into your interpretation and your reporting of results. And we wouldn't really recommend that we ever, in a remote assessment context, call out specifically scores should be interpreted with caution. We see that a lot in some, um, as we observe the field and what people are doing in this area, we see a lot of scores should be interpreted with caution in reports or suggestions that people say that. And we really um, don't recommend that because, of course, as professional scores should always be interpreted with caution. Norm reference standardized tests are one snapshot in time, uh, and so we always interpret scores with, con with caution no matter what we're doing. So to add them into a report for a telepractice context seems maybe. Um, not not quite right. Instead, let's just present what we did descriptively. We did this assessment via telepractice, for example. We used WABAR as the normative measure, and initial evidence for equivalence of scores with face-to-face -face administration has been established by empirical research. Um, and so this, then you could go through and talk about what happened, um, but really it's important as we think about educating others outside of our professions, audiences for our reporting, um, these other considerations are important. So then at the bottom of every one of our documents, we come to a conclusion. And so in this case for the WABAR, thanks to the Boston University study, et cetera, um, we really want to conclude that, yes, it's possible to do remote assessment via, via um, a telepractice platform for the WABAR, and we really recommend that you use the digital stimulus materials that we provide on QGlobal. We do not recommend holding up stimulus books to a camera that will not standardize the presentation, and I don't know about any of you, but I can't hold that stim book straight and steady um, in a camera while I'm trying to talk. So think about those conclusion documents, and I realize we're at the top of the hour, but let me just pause for any comments, final comments from Maria and Emily, and then provide you our email addresses so that we can answer questions, um, and certainly we'll get back to questions on the chat box as we have time after the fact. So, Maria and Emily, any final comments from you? Thanks, Tina. Um, not going to take up too much time, but if anyone has questions, feel free to email us. Happy to respond and share our experiences further. Thanks, Maria. Anything from you, Emily, as final words of encouragement or advice? Um, no, no, you, you, I think um, you covered a lot of the details really well. And, and just like Maria said, um, feel free to reach out to us, um, you know, as you start to 
complete the teleassessments, you, you know, you'll have a lot of questions that come up. Um, so you can, you know, go back to the guidance document from Pearson, go back to the study. Um, but, if, but if anything else comes up, uh, like Maria said, we're happy to, um, to talk with you as well. Great. Thank you. I just want to thank you both, Maria and Emily, for your time and being willing to come on and share some of the details of the study and be an encouragement to those who have joined today for practicing and implementing remote assessment using the WAB-R. And with that, I, I apologize. We have to close for the day. But certainly, those of you that have questions that we didn't get to, I'll make sure to go through the chat and answer them just as quickly as I can. So again, thank you for your time. I hope everybody has a wonderful rest of your day.